Hello and welcome to this town of blood, thunder, battles, sieges, kings and queens and of course Tutbury Castle and its ghosts. My name is Richard Felix and my name is Leslie Smith and I'm curator of Tutbury Castle and I hope today and during the evening as the mist draws in you come with us and find some of those kings and queens of England because we're definitely going to find some ghosts. So, Leslie, I mean, here we are outside, well, certainly the oldest property in Tutbury itself, mm -hmm. the old dog and partridge. But I mean, this place, this place goes back thousands of years, doesn't it? This year, in fact, we found out it goes back even further than we hoped, even as a curator, historians love the ancient history. We have discovered that the castle was in fact a site for Stone Age people, which is a big shock to us. We have found flints up there eight and a half thousand years before Christ. No wonder so many lives that have been here within this place will have had such an effect and maybe leave a residue of times past. Although this is now an ancient building, as you see, the, originally this whole area was a fantastically important medieval town, and mm. earlier still, because it was a Saxon fortress as well. Yeah, of course the name, um, Totterbury, is actually a fortified place belonging to a Saxon person called Totter. That's right. Absolutely right. But and then later, of course, it became Tithbury, a fortified site. That's yeah, right. but in fact there was, I'm right in saying, there was no town here until William the Conqueror That's actually right. gave this place to Hugh de Avranche. That's right. Who, of course, built the very first castle here, the pro proper castle. Is yes. Well, well, the point is there was a Saxon fortress, so it depends yes. what you mean by castle. Yeah. Uh, and what William, of course, was very good at was taking over what was already a site because it not only was it recognised as a source of power in the area, uh, but also because a lot of the work was already in place. So although the fortified site was there, the people were not here. Yeah. Um, they were in the next village called Hatton, which is physically very close by. And what happened was William the Conqueror said, look, um, if you're prepared to move to the foot of this new castle, this spectacular new hope for the future that there's going to be here, um, then there will be work for you and I will also grant you the right to market. Having the right to market was a hugely important economic issue because in truth it meant that the whole area would be massively sustained economically yeah. because only Lichfield, Stafford and Tutbury were granted this. Gotcha. You also have to consider that if the conqueror in 1066 gave orders to build this castle, you listen to that date, the conqueror arrived in October, his coronation wasn't it Richard, was on December. Christmas Day, yep. and in that two month he gave order to build this castle. It must be a hell of an important spot and it must be politically terribly important for him to have taken such trouble in such a short window of time. Yeah, yeah. He was busy that year in 1066 yeah. for sure. So in fact there has been life death and emotion on this site for thousands of years. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, ten and a half thousand years it looks like. Mm. We've certainly got for there. And here within the village, uh, there would have been a settlement here in, in a small way. But in a mm. large way, it was definitely the conqueror who made it yeah, happen here. Yeah. Um, and so there would have been all sorts of houses all the way round uh, the castle itself and spreading out according to trade. Yep. Because, of course, when you've got right to market, people will settle here. Of course they will, exactly. We know that Tutbury at one point had 42 different trades. Now, that's incredible. All of you can work out about 18 different things, going from making arrows to stargazing to apothecaries and barber surgeons, this sort of thing. But you'll find 42 trades, a difficult number to reach, an incredibly important place. Of course, yeah. So they're obviously... There are lots of ghosts here, we know that, in Tutbury itself, but the castle, well, I mean, we are talking quite genuinely of Tutbury Castle being one of the most haunted castles in England. Oh, without doubt. Yeah. I mean, it rivaled Windsor yeah. in 1361, and if you consider the volume of and the amount, not just of physical people, but of what they're fighting for. Exactly. Uh, and they're fighting for royalty, they're fighting for trade in the area, uh, and there were literally life and death in, in a very large and concentrated way up there. So there's bound to be trouble. Exactly. I think the best thing we can do is go up the hill and have a look. If you dare. So here we are, Leslie, approaching Tutbury Castle this magnificent gateway, reputed to be John of Gaunt's gateway. 
Well, it's named John of Gaunt's Gateway because we know he did a lot of building work here in 1361 and 1362. He, he made tremendous changes here. He was a fantastically wealthy man, of course, father of uh, Henry IV. Yeah. So although it's called that, we know the root of it is older. Yeah. Uh, there is evidence here of building work that's considerably older. Yes. Mm. But this gateway is so many lives through here. That's the thing. I mean, it's so poignant, isn't it, that we're walking through here as so many people, some tormented, uh, such as Mary Queen of Scots, of course, who actually would have ridden through this gateway. And absolutely petrified, that girl. Oh. She had got two dead husbands, a third going mad in a Danish jail, you know, a son left behind. She'd really lost so much mm. and when she came here she knew she was finished and washed up mid-twenties it said she vomited blood she was so terrified she got from her horse and vomited blood um, and that of course is something that the human aspect suddenly hits you oh yeah you know, we hear these names and we talk about them don't we in life or in history books and then suddenly you've got this girl trying to keep her dignity desperately coming to this place where she's looked at the place of her enemies in the heart mm. of england she must have been absolutely terrified oh yeah exactly i mean and it's terrifying now no it? it is and imagine huge wooden gates here barred the the clamor of, of, of battle, um, the number of soldiers trying to get through these gates, the number of soldiers on this side trying to stop them coming through the gates, and the number of sieges that, that actually took place here. No wonder, of course, there are ghost stories uh, to do with, with, the, with this gateway. And of course there is one, isn't there, an incredible story oh, yes, here. Incredible story, yes, the keeper, that's right. What do you know about well, what I have mean, you heard? Well, I mean, my stories are that, that people coming to a, a craft fair here one day, a um, young chap and his, his girlfriend apparently came here and were accosted by a man in, in costume, in uniform, That's the one. That's the uh, one. a knight in armour sort Actually, of. Actually, he wasn't uniform, he was in full armour. Really? And, um, he was a massive man apparently, and this chap came and complained. Is that the. Is that yes, absolutely. And said. And said some idiot of an actor has just jumped out in full armour and told me to get over the fence. What's he talking about? That's it. And, and the thing that makes it so pressing and exciting, that comment, is because we know historically this figure has been seen, but what he says, in fact, is, get thee hence. Old English. And, of course, he didn't realise what he was hearing. And, of course, he said, why is this bloke asking me to get over the fence? And I found that, I have to say, Richard, one of the most pressing bits of evidence, mm. because he had no idea what he was hearing. This huge man. Imagine the power of the keeper of this gateway. It was a terribly important job. Yeah. Uh, because he decided who came in or out and had tremendous uh, power in controlling this gateway. It yeah. wasn't the only entrance to the castle, but this certainly became absolutely the main entrance of the yeah. castle. Yeah. This figure is being seen regularly, and there's a very, very strong atmosphere here. Yes, indeed. Uh, and we also have a very unpleasant and frightening photograph of a woman whose eyes are clearly lights, yes. uh, looking down, and a babe in her arms that you can see clearly right up. And the reason that was impressive is I was there when the photograph was taken. It absolutely he wasn't faked and the man had no idea that there once had been apartments of course up here. oh yeah and and i'll let you see that photograph because it's very unnerving good grief now of course here uh, on the gateway as well um was it sir ralph sadler who who had apartments here or in fact sadler was one of mary's first keepers uh, he might have done but mm. the one we most particularly remember is amius paulette of course he yes was the last keeper of mary and he was uh, a puritan and obsessively disliked her he saw a sort of a, the whore of babylon mm. and um, he was terrified uh, really in many ways that she would get out and spread catholicism yeah, yeah. Uh, with her so we know that he actually decided to lodge himself over this S gate so that he could actually yeah. keep an eye on the he town was so fierce about her and an eye on the main way into That's the right. into Make the castle. Sure there was no hope she could get out. Yeah. You see. And we've got to remember this is a citadel on mm. top of a hill. We see it as a ruin now because of Cromwell, but in fact it had huge walls yeah. and it was packed with streets, packed with cobble streets, black and white houses, uh, nearly a thousand souls here at its yeah. height. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic place of huge yeah. energy, perched high on this wonderful glacial. Yeah. And hill. of course the thing is, how many souls are still here now? Well, when I first came here, I thought. I wonder if this is nonsense. Mm. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. No. You cannot possibly be here as I have been and seen what I have seen. And as much as I'd like to say I have a fantastically logical mind as a oh, historian, yeah. Yeah. it cannot possibly... Look, there's something here. Yeah. There's no question. Let's go and find him, shall we? They say walls have ears, but, I mean, here we are on the top of the battlements. Huge stone walls here. I'm a great believer, as you probably know already, in the stone tape theory, oh, yes. where traumatic and tragic events, such as death, can be recorded into the fabric of the building. 
we'll talk a little bit about that later, but I mean, if you, well, just imagine the number of people, the kings, the queens, the dukes, the lords, and, and the ordinary soldiers that stood here against these battlements, watching the huge armies arrayed here, waiting to lay siege to this place. It must have been terrifying. Absolutely. I mean, it's just like a history book, this place. Mm. It's as if you fall open the pages and out come tumbling these fantastic names. But also, I think of the laundresses and the star grazers and the dong fathers and all the other jobs that are done here. And there were a lot of folks here in this ruin on a hill, but of course in its time, it was absolutely complete and beautiful. Oh yeah, Very and it, here it is looking out over Staffordshire Derbyshire. Yeah, on I mean, the border. Yeah, the border. and I, I, I actually call this Derby's Castle uh, because it's yes, so close. Mm. But the real reason, of course, is that for 127 years, Tutbury Castle was the headquarters of the Earls of Derby. That's right. Um, the de Ferrers family. And this castle was actually given to Henry de Ferrier uh, from Ferrier and uh, Chambray in, in Normandy, obviously for helping him um, yes. in 1066. Yes. But they became Earls of Derby after the Battle of the Standard, when King Stephen gave them that title, and hung on to it for 127 years. But the problem is, they were always rebelling against the king. Yeah, they were always back the wrong horse. They were inevitably following the prince, and of course, needless to say, the monarch got a bit fed up with this. De Ferris were fantastically powerful. This was head office for 200 manors yeah. for them. 200 manors in their name, the De Ferris. And that's not just buildings, of course, it's great plots of land as well. So if you consider all of that as a whole, you realise suddenly that the de Ferris needed to be handled with care. Oh, yeah. And I suspect that's why uh, it was such a long time before the monarch finally said, right, enough, because they really have become that's uh, right. threatening. And eventually took it off them, right. gave them to the, one of the king's youngest sons, um, Edmund, who became Earl of Lancaster. Right. And then in 1399, it was given to Henry Bolingbroke, who, of course, was he became Henry IV, mm -hmm. the king. Mm -hmm. And from that time onwards, it became the property of the sovereign. Yes, and remained there. Yeah. And remained there to this day, uh, the Duke of Lancaster. Her Majesty the Queen is the Duke of Lancaster. Despite the fact she's a woman, that title remains as androgynous, you say. Mm. And you've got to think to yourself as well, other than that 11-year gap when Cromwell came here yep. and tore the heart out of this castle and this area for his own cause, you also have to realise during that time when this was happening that the Crown was determined to be back here and they did. Charles yeah. II himself came here. Although ruined and, and repaired some of it, the castle remains much loved by the monarch. Sobering thought, isn't it? It is a sobering thought, all those lives. Yeah. I'm standing in front of the 15th century North Tower. This is the highest tower still preserved at Tutbury Castle and it has a ghost story. A young lady lived here with her husband and the husband went off to fight so she took a lover and of course the husband came back early and caught the two of them here in the tower. A fight broke out, the lover was killed and the husband unfortunately died a few days later from blood poisoning after his wounds. The young lady, of course, by that time had got neither lover or husband, and she took herself to the top of this tower and threw herself off. And she died somewhere down here at the foot of the tower. And her ghost is still seen wandering around the area at the bottom of the tower. And her ghost is also seen on the staircase of the tower inside. People visiting this tower sense a strange atmosphere, a sad atmosphere in here. And they say that anyone who lights a candle on this staircase, it never stays lit. It appears to be snuffed out by unseen hands. Now, you know I'm a stickler for the truth. Um, and legend has it that a candle won't stay lit in this tower. So I've been and got some matches and a candle, and we'll see what happens. Proof or not. <laughs> got plenty of matches.
Oh my God. Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Tell you what, I said it was the it was the tallest tower at Tupbury. It's a long way up here, but there's a reason. I was doing a ghost walk a few years ago in Tupbury, and I was in one of the pubs. A lady heard me talking, and she said, uh, "Do you mind if I interrupt? Because I've got a ghost story about the castle and Mary Queen of Scots and her son." was doing a dare here. He spent the night in the North Tower knowing the ghost story of the White Lady. He was only 13 and middle of the night he heard moaning actually down below, long way down below. And remember he was on his own here. He came to the top here and looked out and he saw a figure, a white figure of a woman gliding in between where the tent is now and the chapel and he said that in all the history books he'd seen the pictures of Mary Queen of Scots were exactly the same as the ghostly figure that he saw gliding across the grass here at Tutbury in the middle of the night and then the other thing that the lady said to me was by the way my son is not the sort of person to make up stories and he's now a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Marines and he still tells the story to this day and she said he's not the sort of person to either be frightened of ghosts or to make up ghost stories. So he's one of the many people that have actually witnessed, seen the ghost of Mary Queen of Scots here at Tutbury Castle, her most hated prison. Welcome to the dungeons of Tutbury Castle. This dark, dank underground room here is believed to be one of the dungeons of the original castle. The number of people that actually walk into this place stand for a few seconds and then turn and run. I must be honest with you, there is obviously a very damp atmosphere and it is extremely cold down here. There's a figure that's seen frequently lurking in the corner of the room down here. Large figure with a cloak and a hood. They believe it to be one of the torturers referred to as a necromancer an evil demon, a harbinger of death that still roams down here. And the figure has also been seen standing outside, standing by this doorway, I presume, waiting, waiting for his next victim. It's not a place that uh, is too bad in the daytime, it is quite light outside, in fact the sun's shining, but I would imagine when nightfall comes that this place will take on a very, very different aspect. And I certainly don't want to be down here, not in the dark. So I'll be to hasty retreat now. I'm about to enter St Peter's Chapel. This was built in the 1170s and is the oldest part of Tutbury Castle. It was originally two stories high. It was mainly destroyed, as most of the castle was, after the English Civil War by Cromwell's soldiers. But uh, if you can just imagine the emotion, um, the collective emotion and fear that would have taken place 
inside this building. People coming in and praying while they were under siege, praying for safe deliverance from this terrible place. And there is a ghost story connected with this building. Many years ago when they were doing an archaeological dig here, this was when a gentleman called Barry Vallens was the custodian and he lived just across there where the Great Hall is. He found a Tudor ring somewhere buried inside the mortar of the church. He took the ring obviously back to where he lived and kept it there, presumably to show the archaeologists when they came back. Middle of the night, him and his wife fast asleep and they heard a rapping on the window by the front door. Barry of course wondered who it was, went down and opened the door. There was no one there. This happened on three successive nights, exactly the same. The last night when it was windy and, and the rain was beating against the windows but they still heard this rapping on the window. Open the door, nobody there. That was too much for Barry. And the following morning he took the ring back, put it back in the mortar and left it. And that ring is still somewhere here, preserved in the mortar of this church. And of course, the wrappings, the tappings on the window stopped and have never started again. Now this place was, was under siege many, many times and you must remember that people under siege, of course, well, they can't get out. They get killed in here for whatever reason, but a lot of people die in here. And one of the tactics, of course, of a besieging army is to actually spread plague inside the place by doing dreadful things like um, firing arrows with pieces of rotting meat into the fort. And there are many people buried here and they believe that in between these two trees down there is a huge pit, possibly a plague pit, and they reckon that there's up to 300 bodies buried inside Tutbury Castle. And people often see spirit lights that are flitting about around the area of these trees, and they believe those to be the spirits of those poor unfortunate souls that are buried down there. Buried, of course, probably without the last rites being given to them. Buried in unconsecrated ground. Hence the fact that they're not at rest. But up here, on the highest point, is a folly. This is not actually part of the ruins of Tutbury Castle. This was actually built here by Lord Vernon, who owned the property and he just had it built as a rather attractive ruin. But underneath here is believed to be an oubliette, which is a large dungeon, a place where people were actually imprisoned, thrown in and forgotten about. And one day, hopefully, someone will come along here and do a dig to either prove it or disprove it. But on many, many occasions, people see figures, ghostly dark shadows, wandering about up here amongst these ruins. So welcome to the Great Hall. This is the absolute heart of Tutbury Castle. In here Charles I was and also his nephew, Prince Rupert. Also in here, Charles II, and there's an ancient wall in here which dates from the 1100s. I sit before you now as Mary, Queen of the Scots. I have the right accent, for by now I have been imprisoned. It is 1585 for nearly 20 years in England. I'm wearing the sort of gown exactly that I would have worn, taken from the record as prisoner here at Tutbury, my most detested prison. There's no doubt about it for a lot of people who come here looking for Mary, they find her in me. Not just because of the way I look, but I do admit, although I originally thought it was nonsense, that there is something that does happen here when I wear this gown. It's as if I'm almost recognised, and from me comes a different stillness. And when I'm speaking to people, 
I do know something remarkable can happen. Some say it's mass hysteria. I do remember a team of psychologists who came to see me one night and one of them said, a marvellous thing, you're making us think about history and look what's happened, therefore we hallucinate. And she's the woman who actually fainted in the King's bedroom. So it doesn't pay to be cynical here at Tuckbury Castle because it is an extraordinary place. We've had eight scientific teams out in the last four years and without exception they are flummoxed about what on earth happens here. I'm now going to see if I can speak to you as Mary. Sometimes I'm just playing the role and sometimes something more happens. One thing's for sure, Mary Stewart has something to say still. I believe she uses me like an answer phone occasion you are. I'm certainly not claiming to be a medium or an actress. I'm just an answer phone machine for a dead queen who had great sadness here. And I have a huge empathy for her and the living and the dead who've been here in this castle and those who will come in the future. You see me as I was in my 43rd year here. I am your mighty and most merciful monarch, if only you'd have listened. But instead you chose Elizabeth, daughter of the goggle-eyed whore Anne Boleyn, to be your queen. When I first rode here, I knew I was finished. I had fallen like a dark star from the heavens to be with you. I can smell the wood smoke now and people running from their common houses to look upon me. I was five foot eleven when the average woman was four foot eleven. Red hair pouring down my back, so heavy you couldn't lift it with one hand. I was queen of all of Scotland and queen of all of France when England was in the filth. And I appear before you now in this form, I let you down, England, and I am sorry. At about this time, a man from Derby, called Babington, reached out a hand to me and said, I have loved you long. He was my last chance. The crown of heaven or the crown of England. And I took his hand, and so would you. For there had been no knight in shining armour for me. No France, no Spain, no other Catholic country to challenge the Protestant queen with the coal bed. You had me held habeas corpus here in England. My blood is upon your head and your ancestors. Kyrilles and Domiles on Kyrilles. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, as we must all say. I went from here to Chartley on the Stafford Road and there was arrested into Fothering Hay, where I was tried and found guilty as a traitor. How can I be a traitor? I'm not even English. I'm French and Scottish. But on the 8th of February 1587 I came out of my rooms, said to my girls who were screaming, Ne cru pour moi quoi j'ai promis vous. Don't cry for me one drop, I've promised you. I was saying I'm all right with great courage there, in a black gown with acorns on me of pearls and little gold cups, the sign of faith. For I was dying for my faith too, we are sure of that as well. My executioner was Simon John Bull, there lolling in a white shirt, and his assistant to hold down my legs, and I an anointed queen. I put gold into his hand, thank you, I forgive you, you're sending me home. And having taken off the black gown and beneath the red gown of the martyr, I put out my arms and said goodbye to England, tail your manners. He swung at me and he missed. Back of my throat three times there, gagging blood. In the end I did lay still the great white queen of Europe. And although I left this earth all those years ago, there is some of me that is here still. There is still much of me that reaches out to man, and you certainly reach out to me.
And now, uh, back as Leslie, um, um, there's no doubt about it that the reenactment, um, for some reason, does actually conjure up, for want of a better word, spirits. And, and we've obviously proved it yet again. But um, it's not only reenactment and, and clothing, but actual real items. And of course, this room is actually full, isn't it, of, of original historic items that I presume hold memories. Well, they may do. And if you consider what some of them did for a living, no wonder. Exactly. I mean, here at the castle, it's very important as much as we possibly can. We have items that are absolutely the real thing with the with the correct provenance, in other mm. words, the correct background, we can prove what it is. We're Elizabethan armour. A lot of people find this extraordinarily powerful. And there's lots of claims of, of a face being seen in there. And I have had photographs uh, sent to me of a, of a face appearing. And quite often on camera, maybe even today, these things can appear. Yes. And, um, of course, one's very wary that nowadays there's a great deal of fakery that's possible with computers and this sort of thing. Yeah. But I'm satisfied these are perfectly ordinary folks who, who have had maybe a trick of the light or their own experience of it. That is definitely real. Yes. This costume, because it's absolutely not fancy dress, but mm. so very accurate, um, it, the impact of me I know is strong, this white face and the look of it and the tragedy of it. But also, enormous number of people, I do mean enormous, see these lights coming from yes. me, um, this whirlwind that will appear near me. These things are seen on me in civvies, I have to tell you, but nothing like the volume. It's as if they come to look at me. You know, it's extraordinary. Yes. Um, I mean, look at this piece of furniture. Mm. This is real, and when Shakespeare was alive, it was in use, a court cupboard. Yeah. So I always relate to people when I'm talking about history, because it is, again, I say to you, it is the people that make history fascinating. Correct. Yeah. What did they smell like? What did they eat? How did they live their lives? And it's as if we want to take the pain away for some of them as well, yes. like me. Yeah. People still pray for me now. It's a remarkable thing and something I'm very glad for. When I say me, I mean Mary, of I course. Know. So here we have the court cupboard. And over here we have something extraordinary. Now look at this chest here, Richard. Mm. This I mean, is extraordinary because you can history. touch it. It's wonderful English oak. It was an antique when Henry VIII was born. When Henry VIII was a baby in his mother's arms, this was already an antique. And if you look at how big the planks are that cut down the oak tree that made this piece mm. of furniture, is it a thousand-year-old wood? God, yes. And who's lent on it, and what did they mm. giggle about? And was mm. it the same thing as now? Well, of course, we are not so different. No, we're not. I'm only removed from you by 25 generations. <laughs> you all knew three with Grandma. She told you of another three. So there's six off the bill in one conversation. So that's close, isn't it? It is, yeah. This is a real diplomatic bag from the 1500s, mm. but this is one thing that does seem to have an extraordinary energy of its own. It's extremely rare. Um, it is, in fact, a real execution yes, sword. I know. Now, I know you've seen this before, because you and I have worked together over the years. Now, there's been a tremendous amount of activity about this, and I'm satisfied that people who have these experiences don't know what it is. <coughs> now, yeah. because of what we're doing today with the filming and the folks who want to draw close and see this, they will know now. But I've had far too many people pick it up so they can smell blood. Maybe it would say it's mass hysteria. But the fact that it is a real execution sword, it really has been used. You'll see I'm holding it because we like our visitors, so we keep it blunt these days. Uh, but in its day, it could cleave hair on water, they say. Gosh. So it's a dispatcher. Yeah. Uh, an extraordinary piece and this very small handle proving again its accuracy because um, people were tiny yeah. this man would have had thick fingers of course as you well know mm -hmm. and um, so it is a fantastically exciting piece um, but whatever else we say this corner of the room mm. as you know we've had creaking and banging oh, we've gosh. had tapping on the, the window windows here. yes um, I have frequently had the lights go down in the room while I've been speaking. It's absolutely not a stunt. On one occasion when I was very angry as Mary, and I feel she definitely was around as I was speaking, the lights actually went out completely. Right. And it was a bit panicky for people. Um, don't think... I don't know, but I mean, I used to juggle with the logic of this, but I have to say to you, I do really think there is something now. Oh, yes. I mean, this is not wishful thinking. There no. is definitely something here. Mm. And mm. so if this idea, if stones could talk, something holds the residue of man, something that's been living, like a tree, um, or this sort of thing, I, I do wonder about it. These pieces are placid and easy, yeah. but there are times when the whole castle seems to change. Yes. Certain times of year... I wonder if it's linked with battles or particular mm. events. Yes, anniversaries, yes. atmosphere. Yeah. But it becomes malevolent, it becomes depressing, mm. the staff are argumentative, 
Um, people who are normally very logical will say it's nonsense. Look, I've had some very senior scientists here mm. who say, well, they can't come to terms with it being the dead, but admit that there's definitely something odd. Yeah. Now, the room we're going to go into, the king's bedroom, can I remind you, when we first took this castle over, um, and I had this room dressed out in a four-poster bed for Charles I to withdraw in, yeah. knowing he'd been in this room. This was quite usual. And I had literally dozens of people seeing the same things. There was no mention of ghosts. Mm. Uh, people were fainting, yeah. uh, having dizzy turns. And I thought, well, this is very obviously gas or something. Yeah. So I had the gas board out. Mm. And the bloke left with a dangly hand and said, uh, you've never had gas, dog. You'll have a job. So there never has been gas here. I was desperately through his movement on the throne at the moment, as we're speaking. If you just keep that camera on there, there is movement. The, the, definitely, the, um, there is movement. It's not the hat candles. There Gosh. is movement of the fabric. Can you see that movement there? I think the viewers, I think when you play this back, people who are viewing this will see there's definitely some movement there, particularly on the far side. So as I this is on the curtain? Yeah, and it's very common when I'm speaking. I, in fact, I leave it sometimes because the movement's so great. Well, let it be still. It's as wow. if they are saying to us, um, pray for us, or you yes. are here, or let me tell you a story. But the king's bedroom is not very exciting when you go in it, not very big. But there is something about it that is amazing. I know you and I have known each other for some years mm -hmm. in your work. You had been investigating ghosts mm. way before me. Um, but we'll go in now, I think. Come and have a look and let's see if we can yeah, have something in it. We don't know, see. you see. We never set no, anything nobody up. Nobody knows what's going to happen in here. May I also say, for those of you who doubt, I never allow him to be faked here. This castle is a place of great dignity for the living and the dead, and I won't tolerate it. We don't need to fake ghosts here. We've got the real thing. <laughs> Not a dying costume from the portrait. What happened then? I, I just couldn't open the door. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Except the door, quite thing. chilly. Yeah, temperature. Quite chilly. I, I, I must say, Leslie, that I mean, obviously, I tour the country looking for ghosts. I, I visit places all the time. You should feel this temperature. And isn't it cold? But the thing is that I can honestly say that when I'm talking to people, I say there is one place in the country that I can almost guarantee yeah. that something will happen to someone in the group that is most definitely supernatural or paranormal and I have to say it's this place, it's this room, but nothing's ever happened to me. Well I know it hasn't and it's very rare it happens to me mm. but I have seen people in remarkable states. Now, let's be serious, there will be people who are a bit hysterical, yes. there will be people who are what's for a better phrase, was that what it sound like their mother, showing off. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are sadly just struggling with whatever mental condition yes. they're in. We all are at some point in our lives. But at the core of it, I have a lot of people in this room who spent their lifetime jeering mm. and have had mm. some very bad shocks in here. Yeah. Because again, you're aware you're in a, it's like being on a different planet in here. It is. Mm. You go from that room into here, it's not very inspiring, but there's something absolutely remarkable. Do you know people will come from France to spend the night in this room? We've had that. Yes. And the reason is because when the cameras are rolling or they look, there's not one of us that hasn't lain someone in the earth no. that hasn't prayed there is another life. Mm. And although some of us sound a bit desperate about it, I was not looking for it. Mm. I'm seeking to run a castle here to make history live, but yes. I wasn't expecting the dead. Yeah. And this room has some, a temperature is right. Yeah, I, I, I'm again the one that walks admit. in and says, people, can you feel the, the atmosphere? No, I can't. Can you feel the temperature That's has dropped? Day. But I have never sensed it like I've sensed it now. And actually my left leg is, is cold. And I, I hear this on, on programmes, I think, oh, load of rubbish. But it really is. And it's something that doesn't normally happen to me. And I don't think I've ever really experienced anything quite like that before. Um, I don't know, I can't explain it. it, it it's amazing, exactly. but it happens to so many people in and here, doesn't it? this is a phrase inexplicable. Yeah. I, I mean, scientific teams have come in and they've been, um, you know, we're in charge of our psyche here. And uh, I, the one I really liked was I had um, uh, some police officers from an un unnamed squad who came in who were the murder squad, and they were here to fundraise. And um, in the morning, only three left. 
Really? Now, these boys don't frighten very easily. Um, I remember finding a man of six foot seven who was um, a, a bin man from Essex crying uh, because he was such a state. Look, I don't want people to be distressed here, no, no. but they are terribly taken uh, mm. very often. I do think some of it is mass hysteria, I'm honest. Uh, yeah. uh, but I mean, but that's their personal experience. Others, I'm absolutely convinced. Do you know the temperature in here now mm. is absolutely dropping through the just, floor. Just, I can feel it on the back of my yeah, neck. I can. Uh, around my ears, the top of my head. It, it is amazing. You get, what you get is this. You get a sick, sort of slightly sick feeling. You feel like you're tipping forward. Mm. Um, and you also get, or, or occasionally you get this sort of feeling that way. Girls quite often get a lower back pain, like an intensely yeah. bad period pain. Mm. And, um, you know, we don't know what's happened in this room. No. What do you know who the ghost is, no. or ghosts? There's, there's a, more than one, surely. Well, now, there's sure a child, isn't there? There's a little girl. Now, I know some people say it's a boy. I think there's both, but there's a particular little girl called Ellie. Mm. Now, the reason I say Ellie, before it appeared on television, before anything like this, this room had something like seven out of ten people mm. saying the same name. Ellie, Eleanor. Well, that's incredible. How on earth can that be? A boy occasionally. There's a woman in her early 30s that appears in here, but the one that really scares the hell out of us is the big fella. Occasionally, a very, very large black shape will appear in the room, but I mean seven foot. Yes. And he's very threatening. We've known men pushed over, mm. a sense of choking. Yep. We've had people, we had seven collapse in one night. We had a paramedic run out to come and help me with somebody one night, and then when it was being sorted, she left it with a colleague and said, could she come in? And she fainted. Yeah. So that was just all I needed. Yeah. Um, we've had people who just stand here and talk, and it pours out of them. Now, they may have done a load of research yes. first, yeah. but occasionally they say things they couldn't possibly know. Oh, exactly. Now, the room is amazing, and uh, it's very difficult. It goes off the scale on the magnometer. That's mm. one historic, mm. uh, pardon, one scientific fact. Another thing is we've had temperature drop. The biggest we had under scientific circumstances was 20 above to 2 below in 3 minutes. There you go. Yeah. Now, that's really yeah. going it, you know. Yeah, and is. you could... The other thing, you can smell snow... I've no idea what that's about. Now you must say, smell snow, what are you talking oh. about? You can smell snow. Now, I'm not saying now, Richard, no, no, no. But, but other people, I've smelled no. it. I haven't been threatened in here, no. but I have seen the lights flying, and yes. I have seen people who have definitely seen mm. something. Yeah. But interestingly, at which point do people suddenly say, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that? There's lights going, the lights changing in the Great Hall now. Right. Again, maybe it just seems... it might just be candles, but I don't think it is. No, basically, so, basically, this room is psychically very active. Charged. There's no getting away from it, and you know, if anybody, if anybody really wants to come and have some form of ghostly or psychic experience, it's probably going to happen oh, here. We can't guarantee ghosts. Of course, you can't. Uh, and we're not saying we can. We, we can. What we're saying is there are some extraordinary changes. We've had some hardened journalists mm. here with a cynical eye. Um, I remember one chap from uh, BBC had to fly and then left. Yeah. Uh, he was too frightened to stay. Uh, fear yeah. of the unknown is most of what people fear, yeah. but sometimes the room is very threatening. Mm. There's no doubt about that. Shall we leave it yes, to its memories what's going on out here. and its thoughts and see what's going on out here? electrical charges occasionally of course but why yeah. do we get these do you know one sunday i had a chap here um complaining that someone was playing tennis in the room oh yes i don't know why people think ghosts are around or spirits or whatever energy forces you want to describe it to make one feel easier mm. i don't know why they think it's got to be a cold october day with the wind blowing at night we get them in the middle of august oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and we get extraordinary events and the most frightening i had was this year when a chap uh, who was in fact a forklift truck driver from Burton and there's no reason at all why he shouldn't but started to speak fluent Latin which was pretty oh, good my goodness. and then yeah that was very scary and I thought as this man learned it then he started speaking to me in French and mm. I answered him in French and he answered me so he absolutely understood what I was saying and he said uh, vous ne pas ma rien, you're not my queen vous êtes le grand vache de Rome you're the great cow of Rome wow now of course a Huguenot speaking to me may yes. see me that way he then put his hand to hit me uh, and I got him in control and he burst into tears. I got him on his knees, actually. I said, oh, I was his queen. There were 40 people in the room. It was yeah. just a Sunday afternoon. And they were badly shaken. It took I'm me a sure. long time. He'd never done anything like it in his life, 40 yeah. years of age. And it was an extraordinary experience. That's just his experience. Mm. Uh, there may be all sorts of psychiatrists who might come up with oh, good yes. reasons why it happened. Oh, yeah. But in the end, no, there's a lot going on here. A lot going on here. <sighs>
So here we are in the Great Hall, still dressed as, as Mary Stuart, and with us we've got various documents and, and books um, telling us of all the famous people and events that were here. Now I think this place is so haunted because of the famous people that visited. And to be famous, I believe you have to have more energy, more of a presence, possibly a bigger aura. Now, when you meet a certain person and you say, my goodness, they, they left an impression on me. I think it's possible that those famous people can actually leave an impression on the building. What a great thought. Isn't that and a great so thought? You, it's not their ghost that's here, it's their presence. It's the residual energy. And either the temperature's similar, the, it's the anniversary of when they were here, or something, or the atmosphere's the same. Some yeah, and certain people see it again, hear it again, sense them and here they are now we've actually got a list of, of famous people yes. and, and, and events. people of in, in British history that everyone just about visited this place um, Margaret of Anjou was here Henry the third was here um, Edward the second most of them was Henry's, here yeah, Henry the eighth, Henry the eighth. 1511 he was yeah there. And they weren't just passing through either, Richard, were they? Oh, they were no, here. they stayed. Yes, there was big, long events. I mean, John of Gaunt was here most summers, it seems. Yeah. And because the castle rivaled Windsor... Oh, and there was that... Did you know? I don't know if I told you this. Fantastic. There was a musician and troubadour court here mm. from about 1360 until the end of the 1600s. Wow. And people came from all over the Midlands and danced and laughed together. And they were so badly behaved, I understand, that there was a court of law set up within the grounds. You had to control them. Because they're all out of control. Good Lord. It must have been a fantastic place. So oh, yeah. the list goes on and the events Oh, yeah. Ch here. Charles I, Charles II, James I, Prince Rupert. Um, hey, there's me. Mary, <laughs> Queen of Scots. <laughs> um, battles, sieges, yes. terror, torment, happiness. All these emotions that, that, that have gone on within this incredible old yes. building. And, and who are these people that still haunt it? I mean, we just said maybe there's some residue left of famous mm. people. A lot of people feel Charles I is in the room. And certainly, interestingly, I am seen usually in white by serving officers, I've discovered, largely. Really? They're serving army. Yeah, I've had it two years oh, ago. Amazing. A large group of, uh, of um, men from the army saw me and were pulling my leg about me, teasing them in the night by coming to them in a white dress and frightening them on the ramparts. And, and they were, got quite nasty when I said, look, I wasn't here. And then they realised it was true. Um, so very clearly, uh, it's almost as if they go on duty. Yeah, you see, this was a fort. This was a yes, garrison. Absolutely. It was full of soldiers. It was besieged during the Civil War by Sir John Gelp parliamentary commandant of Derby. So it's a military base. Yes, as well. We perhaps, forget that. Yes, perhaps, it, perhaps that's, that's, that's what it is. But in saying that, although this idea, and I, and I think it's a fantastic idea, this uh, of people's residue being mm. left within things, the child that's in the king's bedroom, we don't know who she is. No. Uh, we don't know why she's still there or why so many people are so profoundly affected by her. Mm. Who is this horrible figure in a long uh, dark coat with oily long dark hair, filthy looking creature mm. who will appear next to me regularly uh, and he's certainly been seen, and I can tell because audience will go, <gasps> yeah. and I think what when I'm speaking to them, you know, a group of people listening to me uh, giving a monologue and they see this man and not everybody does but pockets of them do yeah. and I haven't even mentioned him and he will appear dotting around the room yeah. not looking at me, he seems to be searching for something, yeah. I have never seen him but I can tell you at the side of me I felt the temperature rock it down yeah. really yeah. cold yeah. now obviously this was a place of kings and queens yes. lords and ladies it but was. now of course it's not no, it's, it's everybody it's for everyone and that's yes. the beauty of it because you have taken this place and and in my opinion um made it something special for, for people through reenactment through everything that you do so how can people come how can they visit the place well the, the important thing to remember is that i believe like you believe that history is not a private club it's not ivory towers for academics mm. it's for absolutely everybody Hands on. Uh, of course academics do work here and produce fantastic work but we want people to come here and share the castle. It used to be only open in the season, and in a general sense, in the winter it can't be open in the sense of the gate, because no. if, it's, if it's bad weather. But we do have folks who come in party bookings most days throughout the winter, and they come away as far away as France to sleep. I can imagine, here. yeah. Because you do sleepovers, oh, yes, lock-ins, right. ghost tours, right. ghost walks, right. banquets, weddings. The lot! Yeah. Everything we here. We had a christening here. We had a christening here ah. five weeks ago for the first time since 1647. Twin boys and their brother were christened within the ruined chapel. Yeah. And it was as if the castle shivered and the walls grew up again because to have that back again was like bits of jigsaw puzzle going back 
the lives who come here also bring something to this castle. Amazing. And now they do. Yeah, that is, is the whole place is just well alive, but in a way through 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 dead people. Yes, and why not? Oh, because exactly. You and I, and we shall move into history too. Oh, of course we will. Of course we will. Yes, indeed. Um, Leslie Smith, um, Mary Stewart, thank both of you uh, for allowing us into to this incredible place. And um, well, I, in my opinion, um, this is probably one of the most haunted castles in Great Britain. I wonder. Thank you very much for coming, Richard. It's been lovely. Thank you. See you again another time. Thank you. Thank you.